Welcome to the debates. Predestination, for whom did Christ die? Especially warm welcome to uh, viewers from the United States as we have two special guests I'll introduce in a short moment. You can follow us on Twitter, hashtag predestination debates, email uh, live at revelationtv.com. And then after this first hour, which will be a studio debate discussion, we will open the phone lines. So prepare to phone when the phone line comes up. I'll give you another warning on that one. But we won't be taking uh, emails and texts and Twitter feeds during this first hour. But please do start you know, any comments you have on what is um, what topics are opened up here. And we will um, bring them into the second half. Gordon is waiting in the control room and I'll introduce him later. But I will start by introducing uh, two very special guests and I feel very privileged to be here with you. Um, Dr. James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries. Welcome to Revelation TV. Good to be here again. Thank you. And that's right, you've been a few times in the past. I have, I have. Wonderful. And Dr. Michael Brown, of, um, have I got this right? I was going to say Line of Fire, which is your radio program, but it is um, Fire School of Ministry. Fire School of Ministry. A little fire in it. And the only reason I'm confused is because there's so many different things you're involved in. But um, thank you very much for joining us. My it's joy. Real, thank you. Real pleasure. And just uh, as part of the introduction, you have a radio show which is syndicated across the US called Line of Fire. Yes. And also a website, um, askdrbrown.org. I also have a TV show called Answering Your Toughest Questions Great. that's on a number of stations across America as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. And um, James, you have another um, radio show. And by the way, we're welcoming all your audiences um, tonight. And, and that is called The Dividing Line. Right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, primarily a webcast that we do a couple times a week, depending on when we schedule it. Great. <laughs> so we're sort of free about that. Wonderful. So we certainly welcome your, your audience and your viewers. You know, and hope we don't make a mess of it. You know, we hope we keep it up to your standards. So thank you very much. We're, this, as I said, you know, at previous debates, it's not the Oxford Union here. It's Revelation TV. We want to give a fair um, uh, opportunity for both sides to present uh, their case from the scriptures, and um, and then a fair opportunity to scrutinise what the other is saying. So we're going to start with Dr. James White on. Predestination for whom did Christ die? I think it's important that we focus in upon what the real issue is because we have so little time and there is so much that we need to discuss. Um, most evangelicals believe that Jesus Christ died for sinners. In reality, in church history, there's been a lot of discussion as to what the nature of the atonement was. There's been all sorts of theories that have been propounded uh, down through the ages. But in, in our day, most people would agree that Jesus Christ died for our sins. It's literally called substitutionary atonement, that he took our place. There are many liberal theologians that do not believe in that at all. Uh, we are taking the more conservative track here. But the question then becomes, what is the, what is the effect of Jesus' death? Uh, and for whom did he die? It's commonly believed by most people, well, Jesus took every person's place. Now, does that mean every person from the time of the cross forward? Or everyone who had died before Jesus as well? Are they included when we talk about all in that way? Are we talking about everyone forward or everyone back, all as a body? How exactly does that work? And then what is the effect of that? Because there are many people who are universalists who believe that Jesus did take every person's sin upon himself and therefore eventually every person is going to be saved. Honestly, the issue needs to be boiled down to this. What was the intention of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Christ going to the cross? What did God intend to accomplish? I believe that we have to approach this subject from the God word side. That is, what was God's intention? What does God's word say about this? And does the Bible tell us what the intention of the triune God was? When Jesus went to the cross, did he go there specifically with each and every person in mind? We have some beautiful hymns that talk about my name was written upon his hand. Well, can the person who is going to spend eternity separated from God say my name was written upon his hand and I frustrated his purpose? Or when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, is there something special about that? And what is the effect of Christ's substitutionary death? If it is made in behalf of people, 
then does that make them savable? Or does it actually bring about their salvation? Or does it, is it just a part of what will eventually bring about their salvation, given the fulfillment of either a long or short list of other things? I would like to suggest, and I would like to prove from the text of Scripture, that Jesus' death upon the cross was a covenantal death. God deals with his people in the form of covenants. And the new covenant was established in the blood of Jesus Christ. It was a new covenant death. And I would like to establish the fact that that has a specific audience and a specific perfecting effect for those for whom it is made. Specifically, Jesus Christ died in behalf of his elect people and that in so doing, he procured eternal redemption in their place. And I'd like to just look at one particular text of scripture, sort of as a focus uh, that we can look at all the universal texts and specific texts in light of just this one text. Uh, Roman, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. There's the new covenant language. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called, very key uh, text there, very key word, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. There is a specific purpose in Jesus' death, and that is so that those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. There the intention of what Jesus was doing upon the cross is revealed to us. And so the two perspectives, and I'll let uh, Dr. Brown define his own uh, position, but generally in this, in this dialogue and discussion, the two perspectives are that Christ's death in harmony with the decree of God and the election of a specific people was specifically intended in its salvific effect. We're not talking about other effects in regards to the governance of the universe or something like that. But its specific salvific intent was to save a particular people and to provide absolute redemption for them. And that it actually accomplishes that and that Jesus as our high priest then has initiated the new covenant and as our high priest, he then goes into the presence of the Father and intercedes for the exact same people for whom he has died. Okay, thank you very much. Well timed. Michael. Great, thank you. Uh, first, it's, uh, it's a great joy to be here with my colleague James, whom I've got the greatest respect for, standing on the front lines as an apologist, declaring the gospel to so many different people groups and doing it fearlessly. I commend him for this. And this is a discussion within the family. And my prayer was not that I would win a debate, and I'm sure he's not praying that, but rather that Jesus would be glorified and truth would be advanced. Uh, the testimony of Scripture is overwhelmingly clear that Jesus died for the sins of the entire world, so as to pay for the sins of every human being who's ever lived, demonstrating the grace and love of God to the entire human race and securing the salvation of everyone who believes. Text after text after text is quite explicit about this. Even if we start in John's Gospel with John 3.16, which tells us the purpose of this all, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life, the term the world is clearly defined in John's Gospel. It cannot mean the elect. In fact, John 1.10, he was in the world. The world knew him not. John 1.29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Throughout John's Gospel, the world is either all humanity or humanity in its hostile state. John 15, the world hates you. John 16, the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive. It cannot refer to the elect. It refers to the entire world for whom Jesus died to demonstrate God's gracious love in reaching out to us and making a way of salvation for all who will believe and thereby securing the salvation of those who do believe. 1 John 2 states it even more clearly, telling us in the second verse that the death of Jesus, Jesus dying on the cross, is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That same phrase, the whole world, occurs in John 1, John, uh, 1 John 5, 19 where it says that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And again, if you look at every single reference to the world or world in 1 John, it cannot refer to the elect. It either refers to humanity as a whole, or it refers to humanity and its hostility towards the Lord. That we have overcome the world, and false prophets have gone into the world, and love not 
the world in terms of the world and its hostility, but it is speaking of humanity as a whole. If you ask the question, how could God have made it any more clear? Not only does it say he died for the world and then it defines the world for us, not only does it say he's the propitiation, the payment for our sins that turns away wrath, not for us only, but also for the whole world. When, when you realize that in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, it says he desires the salvation of all men, and then that reflects God's sentiment expressed in Ezekiel 18, where he doesn't desire the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. And then when you see expressions like Hebrews 2, 9, that says he tasted death for everyone, then you come to Romans, the 11th chapter, where it says that God has concluded all under disobedience that he may have mercy on them all. If I said, how could this be expressed? There it's Jew and Gentile. In 1 John 2, it's referring to, to the believers, but not just the believers, the whole world, and the whole world referenced in other places, and then all men. How else could God have conveyed it any more clearly? When we look to see how atonement operated in ancient Israel, atonement was made for the entire nation in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. However, it was only effective for those who would comply with God's requirements. If someone would not humble themselves on that day, even though the atonement was genuinely made for that person, they would be cut off and they would not benefit from it. So exactly what God intended is exactly what he gets, namely a demonstration of his love to the entire world and the salvation of everyone who will believe. Not only so, but Second Peter, the second chapter, the first verse, speaks of false teachers who denied the master, term used for the Lord, for example, in Revelation 6, denied the master who bought them, the identical word that's used without reference to blood, by the way, in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, speaking of we were bought with a price. So people denied, these are hell-bound false teachers who denied the Lord who bought them. Why? Because his blood pays for the sin of every human being. And even if we look at Paul's desire expressed to Agrippa in Acts the 26th chapter, he says, I, I would that everyone was in the same condition I was in terms of being a true Christian, just not with these chains. I don't believe for a split second that Paul's desire exceeded the desire of God, rather that reflects God's heart where he offers salvation freely. That's why the repetitive call in the New Testament, which ends in the book of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, whoever will, whoever will, whoever will, the door has been opened, the price has been paid. And lastly, if we look at a passage like Isaiah 53, where the nation of Israel comes to a realization about the Messiah, and the words are said, surely he's, he's carried our sicknesses and bore our pains. But we thought that he was being afflicted and punished for his own sins. They come to the revelation of Ahavratun near Palano at the cost of his wounds, there is healing for us. Unbelieving Israel did not recognize that when the Messiah died, he was dying for them. And it's an explicit statement in Isaiah 53, not just for the elect, but for the entire nation and world. It's only afterwards that some realize what he has done. So the Father's plan is perfectly accomplished. All sins are paid for at the cross, and the salvation of all who believe is eternally secured by what Jesus does. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to remind you, our uh, audience, that we are discussing uh, predestination, for whom did Christ die, and specifically the nature of the atonement. And I've been taking a lot of notes, you may too, uh, but please do uh, use the hashtag on Twitter, uh, predestination debate, and email live at revelationtv.com and the text number which is on the screen and we'll bring your contributions into the second hour. James, how do you answer or comment on what Michael has said? He's got a whole list of scriptures there. Yeah, I certainly did. Well, a couple of things. First of all, the term all and world. Uh, all is all, does that mean all without distinction or all without exception? There are many places the term all is used to refer to the fact that we're talking about Jews and Gentiles. For example, 
uh, when Michael went to John chapter 3, no one has suggested that I know of uh, in, in this debate so far that the word world means elect. I've never suggested that. Uh, the reality is that God demonstrates his love toward the entire created order in the sending of Jesus Christ. But even John 3.16 limits who benefits from Christ's death to those who believe and faith is described as the gift of God. I would note that most of Michael's response here was not specifically on the atonement, but against the concept of election and saying that it's wide open and so on and so forth, which these are all connected together and you can go and look at debates that Michael and I have done on the previous issues. But I want to focus primarily upon the subject of the atonement because the Bible tells us what the effect of the atonement is. And if Jesus has substitutionary atoned for every sin of every person, then the only option is universalism. That's the only consistent way that you can follow this through. Uh, because of the nature of the work that Jesus did, there's two different views of atonement being, being presented before you. Michael, for example, said, well, the atonement made in the Old Testament was for the whole nation. No, it wasn't. It was for those who drew near. And this is brought out specifically when you look, for example, at the discussion in Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7, the permanent priesthood of Jesus is in view. And in verse 25 we read, Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost, or forever, those who draw near to God through him. That's referring to the same group that we see in the Old Testament who drew near at the time of the offering of, of the atonement. Same people. If you did not draw near to God, if you, were, if you were even a part of Israel, that atonement was not for you if you did not draw near to God. But those who draw near to God through Him, why? Why is, able, why is Jesus able to save to the uttermost? What is, what is it that gives him that capacity? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. And this is what I mentioned right at the end of my opening statement. The high priest who offered the atonement then took the blood of the atonement and entered into the holy place and sprinkled that blood upon the mercy seat. And so that is part of the same work. And so one of the most important things to remember is that Jesus as our high priest is both the offerer and the offering. And what's important to ask ourselves the question is, who is Jesus interceding for this evening? Is he interceding for the people who are already under the wrath of God? If he died for them, he would have to be interceding for them. You have to divide the work of the priest and say, no, you can have this over here and this separately. You have to come up with some totally unheard of function of the priest where he no longer as the high priest intercedes for those for whom he dies. What is the effect of the atonement? The effect of the atonement, according to Hebrews chapter 10, is the perfection of those for whom it is made. How are those who are in the, under the judgment of God today perfected by that atonement is the question we must be thinking okay, about. Great. Um, we'll give you a f your formal sort of sure. response to camera, but then could I ask that after that we'll engage between us um, and we'll, we'll start pinging some questions. Perfect. Yeah, fundamentally, the scriptures are explicit. You have to get away from the explicit text to come up with this other scenario, and in fact, you have to come in with other theological arguments to do so. John 1 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, it's not just God's demonstration of love, but the sins of the world are taken away. It cannot, James just agreed, said he's never said it, it cannot refer specifically to the elect. So there we have it stated. And then again, I ask, how else could God have said it? But the world, all people, not just us, everyone else, tasted death for everyone. I see no other expressions that could be used that could make it any more clear. When we come to Leviticus 16, again, James is not correct there. Atonement was made for all the sins of the nation, but if someone would not humble themselves, they would be cut off. The price was paid. Everything was accomplished that needed to be. In fact, it's the view of my opponent and friend and colleague that can go the way of universalism because I say it's very simple. The price is paid for everyone. First Timothy 4, he is the savior of all, especially those who believe. So if Jesus is interceding for a specific group, we see he's interceding for those who believe. We see his intercession in John the 17th chapter. It's really not mysterious. God accomplishes exactly what he wants and expresses it in the most explicit possible terms. And with all respect to James, I have not seen an exegesis say of 1 John 2.2 or 2 Peter 
2.1 and some of these other passages that really does justice to what the text says in its plain, grammatical, clear sense. And uh, again, if we think of the way of universalism, it could easily be the Calvinists that go that way because of the fact that they want to say God accomplished it all. Well, since the text explicitly say Jesus paid for the sins of the entire world, then you could say, well, then if we add anything to it, then it's, it's not just a work of God. No, salvation is for those who believe. Whosoever will, let him come and drink freely of the water of life. That's the universal invitation of Scripture. Okay. Can I just put a simple question? Are, are you basi both basically are arguing the, the sort of L of tulip? Are you both agreeing that the, 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 his, the Lord's death was sufficient for all and limited to those who believe? And well, are you effective. basically both just arguing the two sides of that? Well, that's, that, that's supposed to be the focus, is the, the extent of the atonement. And historically, at least over the past couple of hundred years, that's been focused upon the issue of what is now called the L of Tulip, yes. Mm. But uh, it, it I mean, needs to... you dispute, essentially, that it is for the whole world? You don't. And you don't dispute that it's, it's the meaning essentially... Of, it's, it's the meaning of the term, the uh, whole world. The, he, he, does not, believe. he does not believe that Jesus shed his blood to pay for the sins of every human being. No. I do. So I would say but that, but it is sufficient for all. all. Is saying that, is it not? But no, he, no, sufficient, not sufficient for all is, is saying there is no intrinsic limitation in the value of Christ's death. The issue is what was the intention of God and the purpose of God in the sacrifice? It's not, it's not, like, it's not like what Christ uh, wins on the cross is some huge lottery amount of money. Uh, and we're worried about what the excess is going to be. That's not the issue. The limitation is not in the value of the sacrifice. Both of us limit the atonement. One of us limits it in what the intention and extent was to be. The other limits it in what the effect of it is going to be. So that's, that's really the issue. Right. I, I, I differ. Okay. I say that we agree on the effect, which is it procures the salvation of all who believe. James would say all who believe are predestined to believe by God. I, w I would say those who believe respond to God's gracious invitation. But it secures the salvation of all who believe. It absolutely accomplishes the Father's purpose, which is twofold. He would see it as onefold in that respect. Okay, now you've taken a lot of scriptures on the whole world, but there are quite a number of scriptures on predestination. How do you answer those? I'm preempting you, but... It's oh, well, I, I, I answer them within the, the larger context of, of Scripture. Now, now, actually, if we were just debating that and exegeting Ephesians 1 and Romans 9, I think James has more scriptural ammunition for that that I have good responses to. Uh, I see such an abundant witness to Jesus dying for every human being that, that I see no exegetical way out of that. Uh, when, I, when I look at Romans 9, for example, I don't look at that in terms of predestining of salvation of individuals, but rather corporate election and God's purposes for Israel. It's, it's, it's predestination to service and then predestining a, a people in Jesus. Uh, so that we all agree there's predestining taking place. The question is, how does it work and in, in what manner? I do not see anywhere in Scripture where God predestines an individual to hell. Just slap my hand, by the way, if I'm misrepresenting what you would say. But I just see that, you know, that there are scriptures on both sides and you, you've given the overview of where you're coming from, but you could maybe throw some well, scriptures in. My, my, my major concern was that instead of specifically addressing the nature and extent of the atonement, we would end up moving back to the preceding issues, which yeah. are the sovereignty of God, whether he knows all things, his divine decree, predestination, election, uh, the, the, the total depravity of man, the fact that man cannot do anything that's pleasing to God, the, the teaching on election, all of that comes before this. That's true. But there, I have to just completely dispute uh, Michael saying, well, I've got the clear text. He has to bring in theology. Yeah. Hebrews 9.15 is a direct statement of a covenantal death that has a specific intention, which is that those for whom it is made, and the new covenant is not with people in hell. The new, the new covenant is with a specific people because the new covenant text, what is that about? I will, I will write my, my law upon their hearts. They shall all know me, et cetera, et cetera. That's for whom Christ dies, and the effect is that they receive the eternal inheritance. Hebrews chapter 7 says he saves them to the uttermost. Why? Because he intercedes for them. What's the nature of this intercession for someone other than them? 
And if you want uh, the clearest illustration of the fact that this is relevant to the subject of who the all is, Revelation chapter 5. We're on Revelation TV. We should quote from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain, this is the Lamb, you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's a direct refutation of Michael's position. Why does it say from if the reality is you purchased for God with your blood men of every, you purchased every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So two, two points there, but the first one is that, you know, you're a Hebrew scholar, you know, there's a covenant. Mm -hmm. Who's the covenant with? Is it, is it with the whole world or is it with only those who believe? Well, the, first, the New Testament does not speak of God making a covenant with the whole world. The covenant, the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, quoted in, in Hebrews 8 and then referred to again in Hebrews 10, is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That opens up all kinds of exegetical questions now, we go back to the covenant that God makes with the nation of Israel as a whole, Exodus 19, or the covenant that he makes before that with Abraham and his seed in Genesis 17, and there are always conditions for entering into it. So it is made with all, everyone at Mount Sinai has it made with them, but they can drop out through disobedience. Or with Abraham's descendants, if they're not circumcised, they'll be cut off. So the covenant is made with all, and then people can disqualify themselves with that participation. Jesus does not use the language of uh, dying on the cross to make a covenant with the world. Those words are not used. A and he does purchase the salvation of people from every nation. Who? Everyone who believes. Their salvation is purchased by the blood of Jesus. Those who reject are lost. It's the same offer, the same payment has been made, but it is effective for those who put their trust in Jesus. And on a fundamental level, at a very fundamental level, when it, it still does not negate any of the all verses. We already have Hebrews 2 that Jesus tasted death for every man. It doesn't just mean all kinds of people or people from different nationalities. Again, it's a, it's a very wide-ranging ex expression there in Greek, and we have explicitly, he's the atonement, the propitiation, not just for our sins, but those of the whole world, which cannot mean all the elect. It means the entire uh, mass of humanity. But here's, here's what I come back to. On a practical level, we are both preaching the gospel. I know that I can look this person in the eye and I know the depth that God demonstrated his love by Jesus taking that person's sins and when I tell them if he'll turn and believe he will be saved. James can do it knowing if he's one of the elect it's true otherwise Jesus did not die from on a practical level since James is giving that same universal message repent and believe and turn away from sin and receive God's mercy I'm doing it in actuality for everyone because the price has been paid He's doing it knowing if that person's one of the elected applies to them, otherwise it doesn't. To me, our most passionate witness to the love of God and to the purposes of God and to the power of the blood of Jesus is declare it to all humanity and then everyone is all the more culpable because they rejected what he did on the cross. If in fact they're not elect, he didn't do anything for them on the cross. And he didn't even demonstrate his love for them on the cross because they're not elect. Where is the demonstration of love they reject? It's not even there. See, now, here's, so how do you answer that? Well, I mean, here, I just pitch in. Does it change anything in terms of, of your witness? Because you don't know who the elect are anyway, so you're going to be I've presenting no, we, it yeah, to all. We don't. In fact, anyway. it's, in fact, it's just the other. I would argue that it's the Arminian perspective that has resulted in all the man-centered, uh, you know, 47 repetitions of "Just as I am" to try to get someone emotionally charged to make a decision, walk down an aisle. Um, but, but see, that's that's not my focus here because I, I think my, my fear is we're we're losing some of the focus because. My concern in this issue is what is the result of the death of Christ, the extent and the impact of the atonement. And what Michael is saying is we've, we've heard now that, well, uh, the intercession is different uh, for some people than other people, depending upon whether people believe. Uh, and the atonement was made for people who did not draw near. So you have, a, you have breaking of the parallels. The writer of Hebrews himself draws to the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, which concerns me. I want to know what, on a pastoral level, when I talk to someone in the death room, uh, when I, I, I happened to be with, uh, with one of the elders in our church uh, just a few hours before he passed away, and we were able to say, is your faith and trust completely in Jesus Christ and his finished work for you? And he said, yes, it was, right there on his deathbed. Well, when I think of Christ interceding for me, is he inter is, does, can his intercession ever fail? And if he is interceding 
for people who are in hell, then it failed. Why did it fail? What is the basis of the failure? Did the Father not want to save? Did the Spirit not, not have the power? No, the triune God tried, but all of it was based upon man's response. I say no. When we look at, for example, what it said in Revelation 5, you purchased for God with your blood men from every... Michael said, yeah, if they believe. There's nothing about that here. The purchasing of the, of the, of the sacrifice of Christ has an effect. And when we say it has an effect only if and start adding things to it, that's where the, that's where the problem comes in because it ends up dividing the work of the high priest. And in but my opinion, we implicitly accept that from Romans, the justification by faith, that there is that element see, of our this response. Is, this is another place where we disagree. Uh, I believe that I faith, I believe that faith is a gift of God. Um, the reason he who, ends, he who endures the end shall be saved. I believe that. But the only reason I, I, I endure to the end is because the nature of the faith that has been given to me is a divine faith. Faith is a gift, repentance is a gift, and the work of Christ is what purchased all of that for me. And as Paul said, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. At his time, God saves his elect people and applies all these things to them. Yeah, a number Michael. of responses. First, uh, unintentionally, James is, is undoing some of, the, some of the arguments. For example, if, if a person does not believe the death of Jesus on the cross has no effect. So something has to be actuated in their life at a certain point for it to have effect. Now you say God does the whole process, but the fact of the matter is that person's sins are not reckoned as forgiven until the moment that they put their faith in Jesus. Uh, another issue is Hebrews. Mark that because I want yeah. to have some interaction with you on that specific point. And if you raise three more, I'm never going to remember what that first point okay, was. Okay, so you can Tim, mark it. Tim will do it. Um, or is forgiveness actuated before there's faith? Okay, I've right. got that. I've got okay, that. Okay, so could I just break in there just um, to say again, uh, to remind our viewers that you're part of this discussion. We call ourselves, we might call ourselves Revelation TV, but also the Church Without Walls, and that means that we're open uh, for everyone to contribute in the second hour. So please make a note of that. And I'm now trying to make a note is forgiveness actuated before or after? Okay, I've got that. I'll bring that up later. Carry on. Sorry, Michael. Right. Even on that score, Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. Does that mean that he happened to know the men involved with crucifying him were elect? That's what he prayed for. Or was that a prayer for God's forgiveness to be offered to the entire world? Hebrews cannot contradict Leviticus and be the word of God. It cannot undo what Leviticus says. And Leviticus categorically tells us that atonement is made for the entire nation, for the sins and uncleannesses of the entire nation. It's quite categorical. But the person who will not humble themselves is cut off and doesn't receive it. So you have to interpret Hebrews in the light of what's been previously established. Again, the language of the whole world, every person, not our sins, only those of the whole world, that, that remains untouched, unresolved, if you go the way that James wants to go here. And I would also say this, that even in terms of assurance, the assurance comes to that person because they are a believer. If that person was not a believer, they wouldn't have assurance. They're not just saying, well, Jesus died on the cross. They're saying Jesus died on the cross, and I believe it. If you were speaking to that elder, he says, I don't know if it's true, and I don't know if, if I truly have believed, that person would not have assurance. Furthermore, according to what you're saying, if you do have assurance of salvation, then all the warnings in Scripture have no relevance to you because it's impossible for James White to be lost because James White is sure that he's saved. If he's not sure that he's saved, then that undermines the rest of the argument. So I have an absolute assurance of my salvation. I never worry about it. I never think twice about it. I know that he who started the work will finish it. I rest in him every day of my life. I rest in the finished work of the cross. That's my only boast. The day I stand before him, that's my only boast. I, I still love the Augustus top lady. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I cling. Are that's, you beyond, you know, changing? You know, if but it, there's it, a if, if, I, if the warnings are there words, and I start playing sin? games with yeah. sin, I start thinking, well, I can do this without consequence, then the fear of God comes because the promises are to those who are Jesus' sheep and follow him. And if I walk out of that in rebellion, then I have the possibility of forfeiting what God has done well, for me. Becoming unborn. Yes. 
in, in Hebrews 10 explicitly talks about the, the blood of the covenant that sanctified us, that made us holy. If we, if we keep reading Hebrews, again, it refutes this, this whole argument that, that James is making. Hebrews 10, 29 speaks of the possibility, th those who deliberately keep on sinning after having received the knowledge of the truth, and it speaks of them having been sanctified by the blood. They have been made holy by the blood of the cross, and they can despise the spirit of grace and suffer a more severe judgment than they would have under Moses. So yes, I can forfeit what God has done. So I have, uh, I would say, a deeper but can assurance. can you then return? Yes, the door is so, open. So, so, so the process of salvation and being born again can be reenacted how many times? Scripture doesn't tell us. It does, it does make clear that God has promised to keep us, and it does make clear that there's severe consequences of rejecting him. I don't believe God writes our name in the book of life in pencil, and it's erased every three seconds, uh, and there can be a weakness with the way certain things are presented. But look, you, you have the... the, the what can be a pushy altar call or, or mm. uh, Arminians pushing a certain way. And, and then there is also the Calvinistic extreme of God will save whom he saves. And, 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 and it can come complacency. Each side can have potential weaknesses and we can learn from each other. And, and I, I recognize there have been great Calvinist evangelists and missionaries. And I recognize there have been great Arminian evangelists and missionaries who do it all for the glory of God. But again, the text is explicit in terms of its witness of for whom Jesus died. We have to start there because that's explicit every way it could be said and then move out from there. Again, Isaiah 53 is an explicit testimony. We didn't understand that he was dying for our sins. That's corporate Israel. Many of the people that would come to that recognition or read those words in Isaiah 53 are people who are lost. And yet there is the confession that he did die for our sins and suffer for us. And yet anyone who recognizes that is a saved person. And of course, Isaiah 53 specifically says that by his, his uh, work, the suffering servant justifies the many, not the all. And that justification is the result of his work. And again, if you say, well, it's partly that, but then we have to add faith, that's where the real issue comes in here. Both of us believe that our position is explicit. Every text that Michael's brought up, I've dealt with many, many times before. You can even hear us debating these things. I'm trying to stay specifically on the atonement because, look, there are all sorts of discussions about predestination and election out there. There are almost none that go into depth on the issue of what the actual effect of the atonement was. And so one of the things, two, two things that Michael brought up that I've, I've got to address. First of all, if there was not a specific people who were united to Christ in his death, it was just simply a general atonement that makes available a general salvation if, and then it's either faith or other groups add things to that then there was, how, how is it that, that there was a union between Christ's people and Christ in his death? Uh, is, is, when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, is that something that happened after the cross, or was Paul actually united with Christ in his death? And can a person who will stand upon the parapets of hell in eternity to come, screaming out their hatred for God, say, I frustrated the very work of the Son of God who tried to save me, gave his life to save me, bore the wrath of God against all my sins to save me, but I'm still here. Why is he still there? What's he suffering for? That's one of the major questions that's always been asked. But then we have the impersonal nature of the salvation that results from this. If Christ dies for a group, and then we determine who the group is by our actions, I say that's a completely different thing than saying that Christ knew me, and he died in my place specifically to not just make my salvation possible, but to actually bring my salvation apart, uh, uh, to, to pass. So in Hebrews chapter nine, uh, well, before then, Hebrews 10, 29, by the way, we got into eternal security and perseverance sure, of the saints sure. and all the rest of that kind of we stuff, which Jim, I'm not, sure, which I don't want to get. Jim brought it up. No, no, it's not always do. But uh, by the way, uh, the much better reading of Hebrews 10, 29 is by which, the, by which Christ was sanctified, not the person. And I would think Michael would agree with this because there's, it's, it's so deep in the sanctification setting apart of the high priest in the sacrifices. It, it, and that is per, a perfectly acceptable translation understanding of the text, is that it is Christ who is sanctified, not the, not the person who is, who is lost, the, the unbeliever. But, but in Hebrews 9.24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself. Now why is he there? Why has Christ entered into the very heavenly, the holy place in heaven? Now to appear in the presence of God who pair Hamon for us. Who is the us? 
direct parallel to Romans chapter 8. It's the elect of God. But he appears in the presence of God for every single person for whom he made sacrifice for sin. Can I just throw in another, because that's why I'm here. There, oh, there, just there, go ahead and throw in. <laughs> um, or, you know, you've said, you know, it's not fair for those who, who are... Um, I, I want to work on the equity of what's the point of all the other people who aren't part of the elect going through the whole misery of human history. So if you, there's want no leave, opportunity. you want to leave the, the extent of the atonement and, and deal with, the, mean, with the justice of God in having created in such a way that he knew what the end result was going to be. Any Christian theist has to answer that question as long as you're not an open theist. Because if God knew, uh, even from the Arminian perspective, that there were going to be X number of lost when he created, then he either had a purpose for that and is glorified in that, or he's not. So I'll, I'll leave Michael to answer from his perspective because he believes God did know that and therefore what his purposes would be. From my perspective, in Romans chapter 9, we're specifically told, what if God, even though he was patient, desired to show his power? My answer to your question is this. There are three options as far as I can see it. Either God can save no one, God can save everyone, or God can save someone. In only one of those three options does God have any freedom to demonstrate the full range of his attributes, including in the case of some, his holiness, his justice, his power, and in the case of others, his loving kindness, his grace, and his mercy. If he saves no one, we never see his love and grace and mercy. If he saves everyone, we never see his wrath and his, and his power. When he has the freedom to act as the king gets to act, and to save rebel sinners who are not deserving of any salvation at all because they love their sin, then you get to see the entire range of God's attributes demonstrated to his creation, and he's glorified in that. Okay, very good. Yeah, apologies, it's not an Oxford Union debate, so, you know, I, this yeah. is how, how it is. But uh, um, oh, do you want to, I'd, I'm very happy to, to drill down further into, yeah, into let, the let nature of the atonement. To, to all of these things. Uh, the, the New Testament is explicit. We're justified by faith. It does not say we are justified by the death of Jesus only, but by faith, over and over and over again. So that, again, undermines the, the point that you were arguing, because it's explicit over and over that the justification comes by faith. So there is human participation, otherwise the death on the cross does not actuate it itself. Also, when you say uh, frustrating the grace of God, well, that's an explicit context. If I'm trying to be righteous by the law, I'm frustrating the grace of God. You, you misapplied it there. Crucified with Christ, he tells us when it happens, Romans 6, with, with baptism, there is the identification of us being crucified with him. We die with him, we, we rise in new life with him. He was not crucified with Christ when Jesus died on the cross. He was not crucified with Christ when he was a blasphemer and persecuting the church. There's not a hint of that anywhere in scripture. And, and what God decided to do as the sovereign king was to create a world Yes, he foresaw the results. I have no problem with, with foreknowledge and, and free will as well, existing side by side as we debated previously. And, and I see no scriptural reason to have a conflict there. But we see clearly that God set things up so that there would be a people who responded to his call to be his. And there are many who would not. So uh, Isaiah is quoted in Romans, all day long I stretched out my hands to a disobedient people. I, Isaiah also says, for example, Isaiah 48, God says, if only you had obeyed my commandments. Matthew 23 is another explicit text where Jesus says, how often to Jerusalem I gathered, wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks and ruins, but you weren't willing. Even with James exegesis that it was the leaders that weren't willing, God said he wanted to do something people weren't willing. That was his choice, the way our sovereign king set it up. Luke 16, the religious leaders rejected the purposes of God for their generation. So in this, Romans 11 says, we can see the goodness and severity of God. Goodness towards those who believe and severity towards those who don't. And we've got to get to the end of Romans 9, 10, 11, because Paul asks a hypothetical in Romans 9, and of course he has the right to do whatever he wants. If he wants to create a world to damn it, he can do that. But his end conclusion is God's concluded all men under, under unbelief that he may have mercy on them all. It's totally personal. It's 100% personal. It is God's personal love for the entire human race and his perfect salvation for those who put their faith in him. Romans 4 says, if it's by faith, then it's by grace, because faith is not a work, and there's nothing that we can boast of. All we're saying is Jesus is the Savior, the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So I see it as quite consistent, and 
because from the beginning of time, he saw me as part of that company. It's as personal as it can possibly be. But there is a demonstration of God's love that comes when you realize his death on the cross is for everyone that does not come any other way. And there is a degree of human culpability in refusing that love that does not come in any other way. And again, there, there are many things God expresses in scripture, says I desire this, but because he gives human being a choice, they do contrary to it. He, and he'll say, I often would have had this for you and given it to you. You say, no, that makes him impotent. No, that makes him a greater God. He didn't have to set the whole thing up a certain way to end a certain way. He gave us the ability to respond. Yeah, you're both capable of talking um, continually for five hours, I'm sure. But I, well, now, yeah, I get the I've got, got 10 minutes um, uh, uh, left. I, you know, I want you to s tr just try and drill, Michael, for anything you think that's, that's well, flawed in what he's said tonight. Well, uh, no, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be recalcitrant here. I'm going to be recalcitrant subject. here and, and say I'm going to try uh, to remain focused upon the specific topic because uh, Michael's comments just now went to election and uh, predestination and unconditional election and total depravity and we're... we're it seems that the arguments against limited atonement are not based upon the explicit statements of scripture about what the intention of God was, but upon a preconceived idea that, well, we can't believe that because we interpret all these other verses. Okay, let's just be honest, we both have our systems, but which system is more consistent is the question. And for me, the ultimate, the ultimate proof of the truthfulness of what I'm saying is, is that if we apply the same exegesis and the same standards that Michael and I together would use to defend the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the resurrection, et cetera, et cetera, um, who's going to have to put up the first flag and say, I can't stay consistent here? That's your indication. And the audience has to examine those things on their own to be able to see whether that's the case. But, for example, Michael just said, well, you're undercutting your own, uh, your own position because justification is by faith. Faith is the work of the Spirit of God within the hearts of his elect people. Uh, Romans chapter 8 tells us that no one who's according to the flesh can do what is pleasing to God. Faith and repentance are pleasing to God. Those who are according to the flesh cannot do what's pleasing to God. You have to be made spiritually alive first. And so regeneration is what brings that about. Well, who's regenerated? The elect of God. Upon what basis? The fact that their salvation has been provided for perfectly in Jesus Christ. And so you see, every one of these texts, uh, I, I am very concerned that one of the thoughts that people might have is, well, no one knows what the Bible says. The ultimate determiner is who is consistent all the way through from beginning to end. And we have debated the first few parts. Now we're looking, however, at another issue, and I want to I bring us back to that. What is the nature of Christ's intercession for a person in hell? Because I have alleged, and I have not heard any response to the fact, that there is a perfect connection between the audience for whom Christ dies and those for whom he intercedes. So I want to know, I want to know, I've mentioned a couple yeah. times, how, what is the effect of Christ's intercession for a person in hell? There is no effect. He's not interceding for someone in hell. See, I, I only responded to predestination. You, so you started I, I, those things. I'm simply responding to yeah. points that you made. And I brought up justification by faith, knowing how you believe as a Calvinist. But in point of fact, forgiveness is not actuated until someone believes. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, et cetera, et cetera, throughout Scripture. And until those people repented, even if you say it was all an act of God, even if you said from beginning to end it was an act of God, until they repented and believed, they were not forgiven. So that's the simple point. It is salvation for those who believe. And Jesus prays in John 17 for those that will come to him, those that will, the Father will give. Who does the Father give? Those who believe, those who respond to his message. I'm consistent from Genesis to Revelation. I, I say without question, it's a consistent message of God extending his love to the entire world and giving an opportunity for people to respond. He set it up like that in his sovereign will. And he, he's that's, consistency. That, that's, Where, that's backwards according to Romans, uh, Revel, uh, John chapter 6. But I did not get an answer. I think you just said he's not interceding for anyone in hell. But you also said that he died for everyone who is in hell. Yes? Right. He paid the so, price for everyone and he prays for those who will believe. There are only a few references to his intercession, John 17, Romans 8, and then the Hebrews passage right. you've been referencing. So, but what is explicit is verse after verse after verse about Could the I extent of the atonement. You, you mentioned John 3, 16, uh, yeah. uh, where it says they stand condemned already. Yeah. 
That's the world. Sad. Exactly. So he's, he's dying for the world. And the world is under judgment of God because we have all rejected him. And salvation but comes to those who believe. Can that be reversed? Of course. Well, we all agree it's reversed because... No, because it seems that those who believe, you know, won't be condemned. And then well, it says they, those they who don't believe are condemned already. Right, but the, the, so that answers your point right there. They're condemned already, and yet if they believe, they're no, everyone was condemned already before the cross. Sure. Right, or outside of the cross, everyone okay. was condemned already. So by faith, we're no longer condemned. I don't condemned. want to muddy your questions. And, if and you the, want to put a question directly, well, by, no, I, I, go for it. But, but, the, the, order, the, the last thing, the order of yeah. salvation, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Yeah. It is not stated explicitly that you were born again first, but you must believe to be born again. So James may have a theoretical problem with it. I just follow the the plain meaning of the text which says that that faith precedes regeneration it's explicit in numerous texts so the plain meaning of first john 5 1 says that regeneration precedes faith if you just look at the grammar but it's not a matter of following plain meanings it's allowing all of the word to speak and what we just heard and what i want to keep focusing upon here is what michael is positing is that jesus does not fulfill the parameters of the high priest because the high priest had if, if, if a high priest, according to the book of Leviticus, had offered the sacrifice and then put the, the, the bowl down upon the altar and took off his priestly garb and left without going into the holy place to sprinkle the altar, would he have finished his work? But Leviticus 16 is explicit. He made atonement for the entire nation. That text works 100% against you. And if someone would not humble themselves, they would be cut off and would not receive the benefits of the atonement that he made. So you're going to have to work out how that works, but it's explicit. He made atonement for the whole nation. The scapegoat bears the sins of the nation. All the uncleannesses of the nation on the tabernacle, they're all cleansed, but the person who will not humble themselves does not receive the benefit of it. Michael, I can't, I can't let go of this because we haven't, we haven't heard an answer to it yet, and I'm, I'm not trying to be a recalcitrant. But, but you haven't answered but could, but could you, but could you answer that point over again you, as well. Well, because I, I disagree. I think, I think you're looking at that and you're, and you're asking the question, when you're looking at the nation there, who is it, the believing nation or the unbelieving nation? The entire nation. nation. They're Whether believing or unbelieving is not taken into consideration. It I is don't, the entire no, name. It's I, explicit. It's I all the rebellions and I, I sins. I think that's, that's totally against even the prophetic message. But here's the point. But it, it's it, there. It's explicit in the text. If, if the high priest enters into the holy place, for whom is he interceding? Is not the scope of the offering and the intercession identical in the work of the high priest. He was to intercede for the entire nation. He also did not have foreknowledge of those who would believe. He made atonement for the entire nation and interceded for the entire nation, asking God to forgive. The forgiveness was offered, and then it was rejected by the people. You could even argue in the Hebrews passage you keep pressing that Jesus enters into the holiest place of all and offers intercession for the entire world and offers forgiveness of sins for the entire world, and those who receive it are those that benefit from it. If you want to be consistent with the rest of the testimony of Scripture, which I'm pressing you on, and honestly, okay. even the verses you say there are answers for, I haven't even heard a hint of anything that would undo all of the passages, or Jesus being the Savior of the whole world, especially for those who believe. Therefore he is able also to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Mm -hmm. So you just said that he's not interceding for people in hell. They're already lost. Why would he be interceding but for them? I didn't say he Because did. You, did Jesus die for them? Yes, he did. So again, if the audience is the same, then the death of Christ for, the, for those who are in hell was intended by God to never have an intercession or an application. I, I, I said those are already in hell he's not praying for. Their fate's already sealed. I did not say he didn't make intercession for others. I said those are already in hell. So but, you have a group of people. But, but, but well, I just want to make sure everyone understands. Yeah. Literally 30 seconds to make you, a point. So you have a group of people for whom Christ did only part of the work of a high priest. No. He didn't intercede for them. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that could it's be intercession. It's a actually. It's a very it, strong text. Uh, uh, okay, but let's but, leave that but, aside. But e e even so, he shed his blood for every human being. And you could, uh, that's, that's what's explicit, and that's what's in explicit harmony with Leviticus 16, an overwhelming testimony. Those who are lost reject that expression of right, God's love. We're out of time. Um, that's the, um, the bad news. The good news is we've got another hour um, after the break. For those who are watching live, 
uh, you can phone in on the live uh, number, which is 0208 9721408, uh, 1400, sorry. And, um, and also your texts and emails will be brought into the second half of this program. Um, yeah, I'm, thank you very much. I, you know, there's, there's some depth here which we'll be able to unpack, but there certainly isn't enough time to go into all of the, um, the depth of this subject. But I appreciate you bearing with me in all my ignorance, and we look forward to seeing you all after the break. <laughs>